Hi, Courtney. Hi. Good to see you. <laughs> so, as I mentioned earlier, this is week one of our Stories from the Seeds series, which it's been our practice to have this series after Easter for several years now. We really believe in the stories that each of us have. We all have a story. Uh, we all have a powerful story. Our story is important. Um, and our story is a part of God's story. Because in our stories, we take the time, keep our ears and our eyes open. We can see that God has been at work and God is at work. And we can have the confidence that he will continue to be at work in our lives. So Courtney and I have spent... Uh, the last few weeks together in the journey class, one of the things that we've done is looked at our stories. Um, I've known Court Courtney for a while mm -hmm. since you were a student here mm -hmm. and a part of our basic community and even since then. Mm -hmm. And then you left and you came back and that's a part of your story that I'll yep. let you share. But I'm so grateful, so grateful that you're willing to come in and share your story with us. So thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Doug. Well, hi, everybody. Oh, I love hearing that feedback. Um, <laughs> uh, like Doug said, so my name is Courtney Stuffelbeam. Uh, Dr. Courtney Stuffelbeam now, as my friends are quick to point out to me when I forget to add that prefix to my name. I was born in Cedar Falls and raised in Waterloo and lived there until I left for North Dakota to complete my doctoral work in 2010. Uh, for as long as I can remember, church and God have always played a part in my existence. Both of my grandfathers were Wesleyan pastors and I went to church every Sunday pretty much since I was born. Uh, my grandpa Wayne, Bobby, as I called him, preached at a local church until the day that he died, and he absolutely adored what he did, and I adored him. Before preaching this last church, my grandpa um, led a church called Maywood Wesleyan for about 25 years, um, and when I say that the Stufflebeam family was a force to be reckoned with in that church, uh, that saying something. So my grandpa was the pastor, my grandma was the secretary, my cousin ran sound, my mom played piano, and my dad was my youth leader. <laughs> so we were a force, like I said, a force to be reckoned with. I have always loved going to church, as it was a place that I always felt special, and bonus, I would get a chance to sing growing up. Uh, the groundwork for Christianity was laid at an incredibly early age. Little Courtney. Um, so the man is my grandpa, is Bobby. I started singing with Bobby when I was about three years old. And for me, it's the pigtails. And that one other picture, like I'm just living my best life wearing those pigtails. I memorized all the books of the Bible. I knew the Ten Commandments by heart. I knew all about the Old Testament God. I, and I could answer questions related to the Bible. All of my questions had answers, and there wasn't a question too big that Christianity couldn't address. Also, for as long as I can remember, I've had a soft spot in my heart for this guy, Jesus. Easter was and continues to be my absolute favorite holiday, and something really powerful resonated in my soul about Good Friday. Now, this was years before Passion of the Christ, and so the full extent of what Jesus went through wasn't known to me, but I've always known there was something incredibly somber and holy about that day. I vividly remember watching an animated special about Good Friday, about Easter, from the viewpoint of a little girl whose father followed Jesus through his ministry. After watching that, I went outside, climbed into my favorite tree, and cried. Even at my young age, I appreciated what Jesus did for me, and I felt the weight of it. Additionally, I would attend the Cedar Valley Church Easter production every year with my grandparents. My absolute favorite part of the entire thing was right before the resurrection scene, three amazing vocalists would stand up in a darkened auditorium and sing the song, Arise, My Love, by New Song. Those lyrics, even to an eight-year-old me, pierced something in my heart, which I would later find out stayed with me. Taking all of that to account, it makes so much sense why I love Easter Sunday so much. One thing to know about me is I feel things very, very deeply. So I'm a helper, and I love and care about people to the depths of my being. Those are incredible traits to have, but as someone who can feel the good things very deeply, I'm also able, too able, to feel the dark feelings as well. I'm no stranger to mental health issues, and not just professionally as a psychologist. 
anxiety started to show up for me in elementary school. Looking back, knowing what I know now, I had significant amounts of anxiety with obsessive compulsive tendencies. I just want to shout out to all my folks, my peeps in this room who have anxiety issues with maybe a sprinkle of OCD sprinkled in there. I see you. The struggle is real, and the struggle continues to be real. Just saying. In an effort to manage my anxious feelings, I would turn to rituals to help me feel better. Okay, I was... I was terrified of two things. I was terrified of the thought of throwing up and of tornadoes. I didn't choose the anxieties, the anxieties chose me. And I don't know why it was those two that stuck. My anxiety centered around those two things. I remember tracing a storm's path on my TV to look at the path it was going to take and if we were safe. Peppermints became my best friend when I was little, often having one when I felt nauseous. To this day, I always have a peppermint on me or within feet of me. And I actually have one in my mouth right now. I completely forgot that I had it. <laughs> and one's here. And this isn't a planted peppermint. Like, this is my everyday, run-of-the-mill, Sunday morning peppermint. And I still have issues with tornado season. When looking for a house right after moving back to the area, I knew it needed to have one thing. The rest of the things were negotiable, but it needed to have a basement. It needed to have a good basement. It needed to have a tornado-proof basement. The fabulous friend and realtor, Becky Bartlett, would always preface houses she would show me with, and yes, it has a basement. <laughs> She's one of the good ones. In addition to anxiety, I also have an intimate relationship with depression. You often hear people say that you don't really know what depression is until you experience it, and I can say both professionally and personally that they're right. I have sat in moments so dark, I wasn't sure I'd ever be able to see light again. But with therapy, a lot of therapy, my own therapy, and medications, I'm able to keep myself out of those intensely dark spaces. The darkness still comes, but I can usually always see a little light. As it happens, my grandpa retired from the ministry, which led my parents, sister, and I to look for a new church. I can't remember the exact Sunday we came to Orchard Hill, because by this time I was in high school. And between show choir, concert choir, straight A's, varsity tennis, speech team, all state speech, all state choir, homework, and really starting to notice boys, things were a bit of a blur. I was kind of a big deal in high school. <laughs> By the way, if, if none of you have ever worn that amount of sequins on an article of clothing, I really feel sorry for you because it's, it's, kind, of, it's kind of amazing. I don't remember when Orchard Hill started in my life, but I do remember how I felt upon entering the building. I, I can't explain it, but I felt God here. There is something that happened to me and still does when I enter into this space. I feel home. By the end of high school, I was set. I went to big house, basic, Sunday morning services, sang in praise bands, was in small groups, college leadership, and got to know amazing human beings within this church people who would come to impact my life in ways that I couldn't have imagined. I know beyond a shadow of doubt that God brought me to Orchard Hill. Its impact on my life has been unmatched. Once again, during this time, all of my questions were answered, and there was no question too big that my version of Christianity couldn't address. Life was really good. Life was really safe. And life was really about to change. From the age of 14, I knew I wanted to be a psychologist. That journey led me to an undergrad and a master's program at UNI. During my master's program, I was accepted into two doctoral programs, Fuller Theological Seminary in Pasadena, California, and the University of North Dakota in Grand Forks, North Dakota. And I chose North Dakota. <laughs> I'm just gonna let that sit for folks, like really burrow down into your soul. I chose North Dakota over Southern California. <laughs> These two pictures, by the way, were taken by me about a week apart from each other. So that picture in Grand Forks was taken at the end of, end of March, like March 29th, and then that picture in Pasadena was taken around April 4th. I, I digress. Anyway, uh, PhD land, as I affectionately called it, tested me in ways I didn't know I could be tested. 
My training involved decimating who I thought I was as a person and navigating through a new world filled with uncertainty, stress, trauma, levels of anxiety that I did not even know existed, and questions. My world was being blown open. Questions were being asked of me and in my soul that suddenly I didn't have answers for. The questions I had been used to, the answers that I had been used to no longer worked. My questions were way too big. My world was becoming way too big. My foundation was being shaken, and for the first time in my life, I didn't have my solid faith community with me. Suddenly, none of my questions could be answered by the answers of my past. My questions were just too big. And some of my major life questions and deepest desires were going unanswered. And that further shook my foundation, ultimately to the point of complete destruction. You see, for as long as I can remember, I have wanted to be in love. This wasn't a silly little wish or a want. This was a deep, aching longing that I've always had. Even from the littlest of ages, I have wanted to find my love. What made this difficult was that I would get like glimpses of it, or what I thought it was, but none of them ended up working out. My first relationship occurred my senior year of high school. This was my first real experience of really liking somebody and someone really liking me back. That first relationship was an incredible experience of mutual trust, mutual respect, mutual admiration. And it led me on a really good path with regard to expectations in a relationship. Expectations about communication in a relationship and ultimately the devastating heartbreak of that relationship not working. My next taste of love was with someone I was convinced I was going to be with for the rest of my life. I met my best friend in high school, in choir, and we became very close our senior year. When I say that I was in love with this human being, and I would have married him in a split second, if only he would have asked, is putting it mildly. We made each other laugh, we had similar values, we talked all of the time, we respected each other, we could travel together, which was a big thing for me and earnestly just enjoyed being in each other's company. He was my soulmate. I found my soulmate, that thing that I had been looking for. But it didn't work out, at least not in the way that I wanted it to. While we are soulmates and we will be together in each other's lives for the rest of our lives, he is a proud, wonderful, fantastic, passionate, talented gay man. So obviously, we won't be getting married anytime soon. And there are no words still, there are no words I can say to express how I feel about this human being. Uh, God's blessed me beyond measure the, um, by allowing us to be, still be as close as we are. There have been other relationships that I thought God was gonna bless me with and I had so many, oh, this is perfect God moments. And every single time God said, nope, and it was taken from me. Or at least I started to conceptualize it that way. By the time I got to Grand Forks to start my PhD program, I was exhausted. I was heartbroken. I had begged God over and over and over for my love, and he refused to give it to me. This wasn't a desire I placed in myself. He placed this in me, so why wasn't he giving it to me? That coupled with some dynamics I was in during PhD land and my heart was being shattered on a daily basis and I didn't understand why God didn't care. God wasn't hearing me. Or what is infinitely worse, what if he was hearing me and he just didn't care? I don't know if any of you have felt that, that question of is God hearing my prayer and just not answering me because he doesn't care? Maybe some of you are here this morning. If you are, I see you. It is a, it is a crummy, crummy place to be. Once again, my questions were bigger than the answers I knew from my childhood version of Christianity. I had started to go down a path that I knew God didn't want for me and I refused, absolutely refused, to, give, um, to feel guilt or shame about it. I remember the exact moment I said to God, I choose this over you. And this was brought on by my hurt heart, my exhausted spirit, and my broken trust in him. My foundation had sufficiently shattered, and there was no going back. 
I think I hit here was what Orchard calls the wall. So it's that moment in your faith where your will and God's will like reach a face off. So that moment in your faith where the old answers are not sufficient for the new questions. That moment in your faith where it feels like you have walked away and I was at that wall. Fast forward a few years. I was killing it in PhD land and getting towards the end of my doctoral work. As I started to think about my future, I realized that I really valued spirituality, really valued it, but I wasn't sold on Christianity. Remember, my version of the Christian faith had not held up in my adult life. It had crumbled around me. I started looking at a few different places, at a few different options, but I just kept coming back to this Jesus guy. Let me be crystal clear here. I never, ever had a problem with Jesus. I had a problem with God. And I know if you really think about that from like a theology point of view, that doesn't make a lot of sense, but it did to me at the moment, at that moment. And honestly, it still does make sense to me. It's something that that we're working on. Um, Through searching, right, this Jesus guy was becoming someone that was more and more appealing to me. After all, his entire message was love. Something that deep down in my soul, I craved. Everything about this guy and the words he spoke in his message was about love. Then adding to that, randomly, the song Arise My Love would come across my iPod and out of the blue, I don't care where I was, I don't care what I was doing, I would start sobbing. There was something about, there was something that was remaining in me from all those years past. That song and those lyrics. And like dead men the guards, they all stood there in fright as the power of love displayed its might. Then suddenly a melody filled the air, riding wings of wind, it was everywhere. The words all creation had been longing to hear, the sweet sound of victory so loud and clear. Arise my love, sobbing, sob, like ugly crying, ugly crying. I know myself well enough to know that if something elicits that kind of reaction out of me, it's worth paying attention to. Looking back, it was like that song was the only thing that remained of the faith from my past, one remaining complete brick among the rubble. Again, Jesus was becoming someone that I really wanted to follow, but as I looked around, I saw Jesus portrayed in a way that I didn't like. I knew what the Bible said, I, right? I mean, I'd, I'd read the Bible, I'd gone to church every Sunday, but I needed more information. I was a completely different woman than I was when little Courtney started being exposed to God. This new Courtney, the scientifically brained, research-oriented, evidence-based intervention, sci- scientist Courtney, needed additional information about the Christian faith, about God. So I thought back to the last time I'd felt God, More importantly, I thought back to the people I trusted to teach me about this God, and instantly I thought about Orchard Hill. You see, for me, Orchard was the one that got away. I tried other churches all over the country, but nothing could measure up to Orchard and its people. Believe it or not, I made an eight-hour trip from North Dakota down to Iowa specifically for the purpose of talking to two leaders at Orchard and asking them some point-blank questions. No holding back no sugarcoating, I was gonna be authentic and genuine with these people. I really had nothing to lose. I mean, if I didn't like their answers, I would just go to another faith, I'd go to another religion. Um, And there was no way in the world I was ever coming back to Iowa. (laughs) Be careful about making pronouncements and like in the earshot of God, my friends, because he he may have other plans. The two people um, that I met with, leaders at Orchard, were Doug Tenson and Alice Shirey. I literally said to both of them, look, individually and in in individual meetings, I'm struggling here, I'm needing to decide which way I'm gonna go. Is the Jesus that is being portrayed in society actually who Jesus is? Because if it is, I will no longer be a Christian, period. I will no longer be a Christian. That kind of Jesus is not the Jesus that I wanna follow and emulate. And in their own deeply compassionate and deeply wise way, they informed me that no, 
They didn't believe that it was, and that gave me some direction and hope from the future. In that moment, I faced the wall, and then slowly and intentionally, I started to walk through it. Now, I want you to hear me. God and I were not instantly okay in that moment, like not even close to okay. But a new brick and a new foundation was put into place. The final blow to my world during that time was letting go of people, my best friends, my current best friends at that point, you know, of eight years, a couple who meant the absolute world to me. They weren't just my friends, they were my family. They were with me through some of the worst times in my life and sat with me through some of those darkest depressions. We thought, I thought, we were going to be in each other's worlds for the rest of our lives, but there came a time where I needed to sever that relationship. And letting go of that was the hardest thing I have ever had to do in my life. I cannot emphasize that enough. It was a kind of a death for me. The grief that I experienced from that loss was suffocating to me. I didn't know what to do. For the first time in my life, I was alone. By that time, I was in Fargo, North Dakota, um, working at the Fargo VA as a licensed clinical psychologist. The people I worked with saved my sanity more than they will ever know. They loved me, supported me, and stood by my side when things felt out of control. But I didn't have my people, right? So I was alone, and I just wanted the pain to stop. Outside of chemical substances, I tried everything I knew to get the pain to stop. And as a psychologist, I know quite a bit of tools to use to help a proce person process through grief. Nothing worked. Then I remembered the brick that was placed when I talked to Doug and Alice. This led me to think about church. By that time, I hadn't gone to church in several years, and to be honest, I really didn't want to go back. Really didn't want to go back. I was still dealing with the pain I felt with God and the broken trust I had with him but I was desperate for that pain to stop. So I went. I was heartbroken. My world and the future that I had planned for myself was shattered and I was in pain, but I went. And I don't remember much about that service. I do remember sitting there crying and then something amazing happened. The pain got better. It didn't go away, but it got better. So I went back again, and again, and again. That moment, sitting in that church in Fargo, North Dakota, was my first step back to trusting God. I showed up, and so did he. Another brick put back into place. My trust in him continued to grow as the weeks went on, but nothing ever quite fit like Orchard. The people, the messages, the atmosphere, the spirit of this place left an imprint on my heart that could never be replicated. Thank God, literally, for archives of teachings through the years. I would sit and watch teaching after teaching after teaching, taking notes, sitting with the information, and attempting to internalize what I was hearing. Additionally, I would watch every week's message after the fact, and ultimately, thanks to COVID, I was watching live every Sunday morning with a dear friend. I continued to show up, and God continued to show up as well. More bricks in a foundation that continued to be laid. And I'm still single. I don't know what God's doing there, to be honest. And there are times I get annoyed. Oh, and that anger, <laughs> that anger comes back. That anger over not having someone, the anger of having so much love to give somebody and not being able to share it with a partner. While I still ache to have someone, I'm learning to be content and to wait. And in that waiting, I have grown. My best friend, Aaron, says that I've become the person that I had been looking for for all of those years, and I kind of like that. Honestly, there are still cracks between God and I where this subject, where this topic is concerned, but instead of hiding them or fighting them, I bring them to him now. My knowledge and understanding of God is growing. My knowledge that I am cherished by God is growing. The thought that I'm a beloved child of God honestly isn't something that's coming real easy for me. Growing up as I did, internalizing the messages that I did, I don't trust 
that that complete and total love is possible, but I'm learning. And I'm also learning that I'm not gonna get that perfect love from a human, only that can come from God. And as much as I wanna partner, there's another relationship that I need to spend time on now, and that's with my friend. My friend whose death broke my heart all those years ago, sitting on, in my tree on Good Friday. This friend, Jesus, I'm learning, loves me with that perfect kind of love. This friend is for me, 100%. This friend show me, shows me what God is like and shows me God's heart towards me. Like any relationship, it needs time to grow and develop and it needs to be nimble as I grow and I develop. For the first time, I'm realizing that God desires to be with me, like he wants a relationship with me and relationships take time. They take effort on both parts, and when it comes to me and the creator of the universe, most of that effort is probably going to have to come from me, right? <laughs> Praying, reading the Bible, and going to church are no longer real legalistic rules that I need to follow. They're ways to get to know my friend better. They're ways to engage in that relationship. And I tell you what, once I realized that, the game completely changed for me. And spoiler alert, I still sob every single time I hear the song Arise, my love, come on, during Easter season. Trust God from the bottom of your heart. Don't try to figure everything out on your own. Listen for God's voice in everything you do and everywhere you go. He's the one who will keep you on track. Proverbs 3, 5 and 6. Looking back over my life, I can see my faith journey from the little girl sitting in her grandpa's church to a woman facing the wall and not being sure if she wanted to work her way to the other side. I ultimately did, and I'm so glad that I'm here. But I also want you to hear this. I still have questions. I still really struggle with some of the answers that I received from God. I am still living, I'm still experiencing life without the deepest desire of my being, and that hurts. That's hard. Nevertheless, I can say without a second of hesitation that God is good, that God loves me, and that he earnestly, earnestly just wants the best for me. So I wanna encourage you all, wherever you are on your journey, just to trust him. You may be somewhere where you have all of the answers to your questions, and that is a phenomenal, phenomenal place to be. Or you may be facing the wall with questions bigger than you know what to do with. And if you are from someone who's been there, just lean into him. He's there. He's waiting. And the beautiful thing about it is all you have to do is show up, and he will meet you there. Thank you. you hear? What are you going to take home with you from Courtney's story? Is there something you could relate to in particular? Um, some of the things that she was so honest and vulnerable about, about sharing, some of her struggles, struggles she still has today, unrealized dreams, coming face to face with, uh, well, just knowing that you're choosing something else mm -hmm. other than God. Mm -hmm. um, you know, what, what did you hear? And what are you going to take with you? Uh, can you hear her say that in spite of the mess of living in a broken world as a broken person, that we can believe that God cares, that we can believe that God is good mm -hmm. and is about doing good in our lives? in all of our lives, in the world around us, that in spite of the questions, even the doubts, that we can still choose to trust God, that in spite of the unrealized dreams, that we can still know that Jesus is the answer. 
So thanks. You're welcome. Thank you. I appreciate it. I'm going to say a prayer for us, for Courtney. <laughs> God, thank you for Courtney's story. Uh, thank you, God, for the good work that you have always been doing in her uh, from the very beginning. And it's not done for the good work that you are doing in her right now, for the good work that you have done this morning in her sharing her story with us. Pray for her dreams. Pray for her questions, things she battles and struggles with every week, every day, uh, that, God, you would remain within those close to her Jesus, that you would continue to have encounter after encounter with her to help her to choose every day to follow you. And pray, God, the same for all of us. May we, wherever we are in our journey, take a moment to consider who you are and what you could potentially mean to us with another step closer to you. Pray for all of us to help, help us to listen, listen well to your voice. And I pray this in the name of Jesus who loves us, who cares for us, and desires good for us. We pray in his name.